I played the video game adaptation of this before I actually read the comic. Like it was, wow. yeah, we, because that I could just get a blockbuster and came out quickly <laughs> after this. All. Like, no one knows who block. No one knows what blockbuster is, case. To the Men of Steel podcast. I'm Case Aiken, and as always, I am joined by my co-host, J. Mike Falson. Welcome back, everybody. Glad to have you. Yeah, and I, I'm so glad to be here for this conversation because we are doing a story that, you know, honestly, there's a lot of things that it took us 100 episodes to warm up to, like big stories for Superman. Um, and today we're talking about a really big story for Superman. Um, we're talking about the death of Superman. Specifically, we're talking about the comic story that introduced Doomsday and led to Superman's death and, and all that stuff. And we're going to be talking about these this arc. But today we're talking specifically about his battle with Doomsday, the death, the, the one everyone knows about, you know, the like the one that drove up <laughs> market values for comics and whatnot. And to have that conversation, we are joined from the Inks and Issues podcast by Kieran Bennett. Hi, my name's Kieran, and I have one thing to say. Krang, Krang, Kroom, Krakoom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's, of course, a reference to the, the sound effects that we're getting from Doomsday for the majority of his uh, first appearance. The, the onomatopoeia and like the, the lettering and the giant sound effects in this are second to none. They're so good. Yeah, all right. so I feel like it's impossible for people not to be just generally familiar with the basic details of this because it's like Monster shows up, actually puts up a fight against Superman. Superman tries real hard. They both die in the fight you know the, the the cape what flowing in the, in the devastation spoilers yeah. i had no idea <laughs> it's not like it's in the title <laughs> right <laughs> i mean it's not like it was one of the best-selling comics of all time that then uh vastly depreciated in value because so many people bought copies <laughs> <laughs> yeah funny funny how that funny how that worked out <laughs> Yeah, I remember back at the time, like they had like special editions for people who wanted to like get in on the collect because this was this is the comic book bubble of the nineties. Like and this is like the epitome of Oh that. yeah. So so they had like black bagged versions that had like armbands for like f- like funeral rites for Superman, like armbands to wear with like a red S on it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It was I mean, because it made the news like th- this was like a weird era where like a year or two before this is like one of the like big infamous sales of an action comics number one for like a couple million dollars. Uh, I don't know the exact value. Please don't <laughs> don't add me on this one. But it was really expensive. And like all of a sudden, like the collector market had really become like a thing that people wanted to get in on because, you know, the second there's money, people will sniff it out and try to like capitalize on it. <laughs> uh, and that was going on here. So people thought that this was going to be a big deal. This is why these like big spectacle events started occurring in the 90s, because all of a sudden famous things from comics all this were actually garnering interest and garnering like big resale values. And uh, people thought that this was going to be like one of those things. And honestly, it probably is now. <laughs> but then it wasn't. <laughs> and that's the problem, which is that like you can't you can't juice the industry when it's based on scarcity like this uh, for a thing. I mean, you could, but, you, you know, it, it's a lot harder to do than, say, like a crypto scenario or something like that. <laughs> oh, God. Can you imagine if they did Death of Superman now? The amount of. Oh, it'd be an NFT. Dead, or at least dead have Superman a NFT. NFT. Yeah. <laughs> God. Yeah. I mean, it's still. In the wind. Yeah. Like, it's still DC and DC is still a subsidiary of Time. Well, of Warner Brothers. And at the time, it was Time Warner. Uh, of course, obviously, the whole shuffle that's going on right now. DC, uh, by the time this episode comes out, we have no idea if DC will still exist because Discovery <laughs> might just say fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, it's the end of September when we're recording this. And. I don't feel uncomfortable making that statement now versus, say, in five months. Like, I'll probably still be like, who knows? Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Uh, w- w- weird era. But all right. So I, I so I, I have a lot of fondness for this book. Um, th- this arc, um, but the death all the way through the return is actually where I got into the comics version of Superman. Like, this was my gateway into reading his books. Cause I, I, you know, I'd started with some Batman and then like a lot of Marvel. And then this was like, Oh, it's a big thing. I didn't buy the issue. Imagine you sit down to read and be like, wow, the Superman guy's really great. I can't wait to see what he does. <laughs> ne- oh, fuck. Well, 
I mean, I know who Superman was. Like, I'd seen all the Christopher Reeve movies. I'd seen cartoons. Like, it, like, but but comics Superman is not Superman the brand. No. And Superman the brand is so much bigger. Very different. Uh, and this was, like, the era where I was like, all right, I'm going to try and check out some of these ones that, like, I've always liked. But, you know, we, like, weirdly, Superman books aren't. I shouldn't say aren't because this is now a thing that doesn't exist anymore anyway. Um, back when I was getting into comics in the first place, a lot of it was based on like newsstands. Uh, and at the time, X-Men was huge. Spider-Man was huge. Uh, those were like the the comics I was like picking up when I was first, first like buying comics. And it was like whatever the luck of like, who you know, what they had was. And, and I'm not saying that there weren't Superman books. I just had, like didn't get them initially <laughs> and, and it was stuff like this that was trying to drive people over to the superman books so for me there's a lot of like attachment to this era because this is me being like oh this is what the superman comics are like as opposed to the christopher reeve superman movie or as opposed to the max fleischer sure. superman cartoons or anything like that so i have a lot of love for this era and i, I think there's a lot of interesting things going on and this also corresponds to when DC started doing trade paperbacks. And, and so they put out a lot of stuff that led up to it after the at, like after the volumes for the Death and Return came out. Um, and as a result, like I've read a lot of the stuff leading up to it. And I did early in my comic book reading career um, and then continued to just read the, the monthly books at, from this point on. So, like I said, I have big familiarity. I am curious for the two of you. Did you read this at the time? What was your experience of it all? Where, where, where is your experience with this, um, Kieran? You're our guest. You, <laughs> uh, I, I, I definitely did not read this at the time. Uh, I was, I was too young at the time to really be aware of like what comics, I guess, like were, um, in, 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 in like a monthly kind of sense. Like obviously, I knew what comics were, but yeah. I wasn't aware that they were like a monthly thing that you could buy like all the time. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this was 1993 when the actual death issue came out. And oh yeah, literal, I was literal, nine, literal so. baby. Yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> yeah. I was fresh born from the womb. Um, but I, I did read this in trade paperback uh, when I was, I would guess, eleven or so, maybe like twelve. And I, I do actually remember this quite well because it was one of the first um, trades that I actually ever read. Um, randomly, um, because I, as, as a child, um, when I started going to a different school, I realized that the, the my local library was like just down the road from my school. And so I would go there to wait for my parents to come pick me up because, you know, library. And I discovered that libraries have comic books at them. <laughs> and so I started browsing the comic books at the library. And then this was one of the first ones that I picked up. So I picked up, I picked up, um, it was the death of Superman and a random volume of like house of M or something like some, some X-Men story that was like deep dropped in the middle of a story. arc. hated that, whatever it was, but this, <laughs> I, <laughs> I remember picking it up and being like, what do they mean? The death of Superman? Well, that's crazy. Superman's never died. That's so stupid. And then I read it and was like, I, at the time, I remember being like, I was devastated at the end because like, you know, it, it is very sudden as, as I'm sure we'll discuss. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was kind of my first exposure to it. And I was like, wow, comics are like, comics are some heavy stuff and that was kind of like the very start of my sort of journey and i i think in the year or so that i was going to that library i i probably would have gotten out like a, a good three four hundred comics um so thank you death of superman for uh, helping kickstart my comics journey yeah so in its own way it, it actually did its job like it actually uh, yeah yeah 100 yeah, percent. i mean for, for both of us actually j mike how about you uh geez this came out in 93 Yep. I was five. So no, I did not read this at the time. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, no, uh, all, all of us did not read it when it was actually coming out because I read it in trade as well, but it was just an early trade. I remember this more for what came after it than this actual storyline itself. I remember it more for like the whole Superman arc that came after this. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I'll go back and read like what actually came to this or what, what came before this and what caused this whole situation. And then there was always like the Justice League shows I like the uh, the other shows that kind of alluded to it, a little throw in jokes in there, stuff like that. I grew up watching, just in case you're wondering, guys, in the ether. I grew up watching the Justice League animated animated shows, and like oh my Batman God. versus Superman. With shows. you there, perfection. 
but uh yeah i never read this until mm, during COVID, <laughs> when there was like nothing else better to do i'm like all oh, this i should i'm recording a show with case i should probably actually like you know read up on this yeah i peaked, <laughs> <laughs> I peaked and i was like oh, oh okay like I, that makes sense because I, I liken this into like the, uh the whole like this and what happened with like optimus prime and like the general uh, the generation one transformers from like the first transformer movie when they kill off all the uh like, the entire generation one <laughs> transformers and like all the kids freaked out and like were mourning and crying they clapped in their rooms and stuff they wouldn't come out and eat dinner or whatever i liken that to this because there was like so much that happened because of this like 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 Kay said it was on it was on his news there were yeah. articles and stuff about this people were like oh my gosh they killed superman what happens next and uh yeah this is this is a pretty heavy heavier than i thought it would be comic mm. <laughs> doesn't yeah. throw out that way but it builds up to it along the way yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah i mean this had you know this had such a cultural force behind it like I played the video game adaptation of this before I actually read the comic. Like it was, wow. yeah, we, because that I could just get a blockbuster uh, and came out quickly <laughs> after this. All. Like, no one knows who block. No one knows what blockbuster is. Casey. Sorry, kids. Yeah. Blockbuster is a now defunct chain of rental stores because it used to be when there was physical media as the default way for you to consume anything, uh, where you would go and you would pay like four to six dollars depending on how new a product was to rent a thing for the weekend or in some cases if it was like really a hot item for only one night um and most blockbusters eventually started stocking uh sega genesis and super nintendo games at a certain point and i had a super nintendo so i gave them my six dollars and i rented this for a weekend and it was fun <laughs> it's a it's a it's a fairly fun super nintendo beat em up we weekend rental video games like not not to completely distract but man i loved weekend rental video games six <laughs> pay, oh, yeah. pay, pay year well it wasn't six dollars for us it was it was ten dollars here in new zealand which is about six oh. us dollars and yeah oh just you just you can try just a variety of things and if it's shit it doesn't matter you know yeah. And sometimes weirdly, like you'd have like better energy because it was a rental. There was one time where exactly. I remember buying a video game or getting a game as a gift. I shouldn't say buying it because I didn't have disposable income. I, was, I, was, <laughs> I didn't know what money was. <laughs> who, who would trust me with money? Uh, who, who does trust me with money anymore? <laughs> Idiots. People who are making mistakes. Yeah. They're the ones yeah. who trust me with money now. Uh, but, but I remember th this t total video game tangent. But at one point, there was a game that I was having trouble with with the first level. And I remember thinking that this wouldn't be happening if this were a rental. Maybe I should rent the game, which is the dumbest idea I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you could get lucky sometimes because somebody might have traded or rented, rented that the week before. They might have beaten a couple levels for you. And so you That's jump true, in. Yeah. I'm like oh yeah, that's always a fun thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I I I rented. Um. Oh my god. What was it? Uh. It was like like one of the, like the, like a Call of Duty or something like some first person shooter on PS2. And we got it home and we cracked open the case and tucked underneath the the manual was someone had written a list of cheat codes that they had obviously found awesome. somewhere. But it was like written in like <laughs> pen. So someone had actually written them down on a piece of paper and put it back in the game. And I was like, whoever you are, bless you. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, the, the halcyon days of the 90s. Um, but getting back to the actual book, yeah, so like like we're, we're saying, this was a big cultural thing. It was in the news. Like, people were talking about it. The fact that Superman died, period, was a story. The fact that they did the, you know, the the four Superman... Spoiler for anyone who is not familiar with the, the major arc of the 90s Superman book. Uh, Superman dies at the hand of Doomsday, and then four imitators show up. One of which is uh, Connell, or will eventually be Connell Superboy. One of which is Steel. Uh, those are the two that people know. And then there's the Eradicator, which was a previously established Kryptonian intelligence uh, who was operating as Superman while healing Superman. And then there was the Cyborg Superman, who yes, I could explain. <laughs> I feel like we explained that before, though. I I. Th I'm going to we're going to have to do it anyway because we're going to talk about the return at some point um, yeah. soon. So I'm not going to go too in detail because it's it's ridiculous. We're going to say that he's bad and that he's part Superman, part robot. And that's that's the surface story. And we're good. We're not going to go into the connections with Reed Richards that are out there. We're not going to go into any of that because it's real weird. Uh, what, we're not going to get there weird? right now. That's crazy. Yeah, that's so wild. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> uh, but we are going to talk about this. So. 
so notably, this is an arc where the entire idea was like, well, what if Superman just faced off against some someone who was tough enough to fight him? And it that seems like kind of a, a, a simple idea, but it also hadn't really been done before. Like, usually Superman either fought things that had some sort of way of tuning into his weakness, uh, like a metallo or a, a parasite who could, you know, siphon his powers, uh, you know, someone who could be a physical threat, um, but there was something else going on. It wasn't just like, oh, me, me so tough. Uh, <laughs> or it would be like another Kryptonian, in which case it was sort of like, eh, it's kind of like just two guys, like, slapping each other. Hey, it's just two guys, you know, two dudes. <laughs> it's two guys, two just bros, slapping. couple of pals. <laughs> so that just rolls up and just like, like reverse hand slaps him across the yeah. face. And like, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, I'm flying here. <laughs> so those were the usual kind of fights. And we hadn't really seen lots of like big, like massive fights. They'd started to leak, you know, leak in during like the night or the eighties and nineties stuff because that was becoming more popular. But a lot of Superman material, he's usually an implacable force of, of, of power. And unless you're doing something to deviate from that, you know, there's only the threat for Superman isn't, to his life, the threat for Superman is to everything around him. Like, that's always the stakes. Like, it's not about him mm-hmm. getting hurt. It's about him stopping other people from getting hurt. That's where you get the drama for a Superman story normally. Uh, and that and this book starts off with that, pr- like, presupposition. For one thing, we start off in, at the time, there were five Superman books running, uh, of which one was quarterly and is not involved in this conversation it actually may not have started yet at this point uh but this is the triangle era for superman where there was four main books and then eventually a fifth book that all were coming out in one month and so they had story they had their own storylines going on but at the same time they also had massive crossovers all the time like the the editors were constantly trying to figure out and keep track of like what's going on in you know superman man of steel versus superman in action comics versus superman versus adventures of superman and eventually superman man of tomorrow uh, lot, a lot of Superman stories were being told. Uh, and so they wanted to do a story that was, yeah, let's give Superman a physical fight and we're going to tell it across our books. Uh, and in fact, they're going to loop in uh, Justice League America, which was also being written and drawn at the time by Dan Jurgens, who was also doing Superman. No, no, no subtitle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so they wanted to do the, like that kind of big story. And they were like, well, what if he actually like, you know, died <laughs> what if there was actually a physical threat uh and so we we work our way to that point and that's sort of like the the goal here and we get lots of cool structural things but they most of those kick in after the justice league america issue because like really so we start with superman man of steel and it's kind of a prologue issue because doomsday is not the plot doomsday is happening in the background he's the opening pages of something like punching its way through a grave or through something, you know, some kind of chamber or whatever, um, fully, fully costumed in like this big rubber suit. And one of its, its arms is bound behind its back. Um, we have no idea what the details of this, of this thing are until after it's already hit the wall a couple of times and you start to see, see spikes popping out of its hands. Mm-hmm. But you know, even that's like kind of, kind of table stakes for the nineties, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was like, come on, <laughs> step it up a notch. Let's, you know, so much so that, in this in this issue, so in the first issue where, where uh, it's mostly just Superman dealing with like the normal drama of stuff going on in you know the the rich world of Metropolis that there is, uh, it's <laughs> they're dealing with underworld mutants and aliens who have like all decided to live <laughs> like it's the Morlocks from X Men yeah. except instead of it being just mutants, it's weird radioactive people, it's weird aliens, it's weird all this stuff who've all decided to live underground together. Um, and there's some shitty people, but there's also one who just fucking looks like doomsday. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, yeah. Fully, uh, fully. What's his face? Uh, what's his face is actually pretty close to his name. Closter. Yeah. Closter. There we go. Uh, he's, he's a concrete man with spikes. He looks so much like doomsday. It's annoying. And when I played the video game for the first time, I was super confused. What the hell is going on? Cause I knew what doomsday looked like. And I'm like, isn't that doomsday? <laughs> Are, I'm not playing doomsday right now. <laughs> Uh, but but it's this whole side story about like a kid who like was threatened by these people so that he wouldn't tell anyone mm. recruiting Superman. Me- meanwhile, Lois Lane goes in there to investigate because Lois Lane can't help but fall into trouble because she's a reporter. Classic <laughs> Lois. Just, ah. She gets a tip off where it's like, send Superman. Shit's really bad. It's about to happen. She's like, well, obviously I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I better get myself in there then. 
Yeah, and there's probably the uh, <laughs> the most dated line in this ent- in this entire book happens in this issue where Lois decides to leave a note for Clark. At this point, they're engaged. At, at this point, they know who she knows who Superman is. Like, she there's does? no mystery there. Okay, uh, like, uh, but she leaves a note on the computer and tells someone that there's a note on Clark's computer when he gets in. Yeah, and when he arrives. That other person is like, Lois left you a, a computer message. And he goes, very high tech of her. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and then wow. as he like wakes up his his computer from the screensaver, power goes out because the underworld creatures have destroyed everything. <laughs> and so he doesn't even read the message. <laughs> Should have written it down. Y- yep. Yeah, because like you can't rely on computers to get messages to people. Yeah, like, who would ever use a computer? That's so novel and high tech. <laughs> right, it'll never catch on. And like the story doesn't have like a lot going on for the rest of it. This, it's just part of the larger drama that they were kind of telling. Um, I do want to note that at, that at this point, uh, Super Superman: The Man of Steel was being written by Louise Simonson, uh, who is an like a, a famous writer. She's like work famously uh, picked up new mutants right after Chris Claremont um, and worked with that until Rob Liefeld became her artist and he was a douchebag and she was kind of ousted by him because he was a douchebag that, you know, the how behind the scenes drama at Marvel goes. So she has a habit of writing more like uh, down to earth stories. Like a lot of the stories involve like I'm trying to not, (laughs) there there are a lot of urban themes going on in there. And I, it's my understanding. It's, like for, and from interviews with her and so forth, like she actually just really cares about societal ills and is like really trying, trying to be woke in an era pre woke. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I think is the best way to describe it. Like there's a reason, even even though it's like at this point, everyone working on the Superman books are all like white people. Like there's a reason why <laughs> the book that ends up having the black protagonist when when they go to the return of Superman era, like why it's, why it is wheezy at, at the helm of that book, because she wanted to like have a, a like more diversity in, in everything. And so she has a lot of the supporting cast are represented as non-white people. And that's cool. I, I like that element there. Hmm. You know, there's only so much that you can really do with it in in this issue because it's like, well, it's a bunch of underworld creatures like rising up and knocking out the power and having <laughs> giant tunnel machines. Yeah, the mutants, side note, where they came from, uh, Metropolis has a lot of quote unquote D in aliens uh, because of Project Cadmus, which is located just outside of Metropolis, where they just I was genetically shocked. modify people all the time. I was shocked <laughs> so that, that was included here. <laughs> I was like, oh, snap, Cadmus is here? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Cadmus is, is always a Superman thing, first and foremost. Uh, it was introduced to Jimmy Olsen, or Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, by Jack Kirby when he was working on the book. Uh, so it's always, like, outside of Metropolis, there's that, that stuff kind of going on there. But, yeah, that's where the DNA aliens come from, which are some of the mutants. And then their creatures from War World are the other, like, major group that's, like, vying for power under. And then also, like, hobos. <laughs> I, I did notice there were a lot of hobos just kind of hanging out. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, this seems uh, like a mean, cause you we know, can get behind. Yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, these these, these weird aliens want to, like, overthrow the surface world. Fuck yeah, let's Fuck go. those guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do enjoy it. Like, Lois Lane is honestly one of the reasons why they this all works out in the first place because she actually, so they note that she like volunteers at a soup kitchen out, mm-hmm. outside of being like a Pulitzer prize winning journalist and fiance of Superman. Um, and so she has like really good relationships with all these people. Like it's, it's nice. It, like, it's nice it, to have it's good. Like, yeah, it's good. It, it, it's all good on that front. Um, this, this was also my introduction to, um, I am going to fuck up this name. Uh, <laughs> John, I think it, it Bagdanov, fuck, <laughs> uh, who is a great artist. He is so he's working on Man of Steel at this point. He has such a golden age style to it. Like later in the Triangle era, they do a, a uh, an arc where all the books then split off into different periods of Superman books. And him doing like golden age Superman is so perfect. Very cool guy. Our friend of the show, Seth Decker, over on the Film Rescue podcast, actually had him on to talk about Steel. So like cool person who's like willing to do interviews about like shit he's created and and all that so i uh, do want to shout out that one because just like awesome yeah it, 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 everything like i i was across the whole arc like it all just looks so good 
Yeah, all the all the artists in in general. Like we'll we'll shout them out as we go because there are just so many good ones. Um, I do also want to note at one point there's just a uh, an 18 wheeler that's just driving and it looks so much like Optimus Prime and yeah. just punches it out. <laughs> yes, uh, I I, I um, when I was reading that I I was thinking I was like I just there's something about the trope of like a trucker driving along the highway and being like. And then, you know, they see the villain in the headlights and they're like, hey, buddy, get out of the way. What are you doing? And then the truck and presumably the trucker is destroyed. And I just I feel like, you know, in in comic books and movies, there must be like a trucker memorial fund, you know, for like (laughs) the truckers who have been so tragically destroyed on the highway. Their last words, nothing more than, hey, buddy, what are you doing? Get out of the way. huh?" And then they die, you know, and he does commercials with like in the arms of an angel. Like, exactly. (laughs) Please, for a dollar a day, you can support the truckers families left behind. They didn't know what he was doing. They tried to get him out of the way. But they were oh, having none of it. But they were having... <laughs> well, I mean, and that's D- Doomsday's MO in this issue, where something kind of passive and nice shows up, and he kills it. Like, a bird lands yeah. on his hand, and he just crushes it. He a murders deer. a deer at one point. <laughs> yeah, and then it's yeah. like, oh, and then that, then then the friendly truck driver <laughs> just <laughs> he murders it as well. But that's when uh, an APB is put out for a monster that's killing truckers, uh, and that goes to the Justice League by way of Oberon. Uh, and so the book then picks up in Justice League America 69, which is also just like nice. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and like I said, this so th- this is the other book that Dan Jorgens is working on in addition to, to Superman. So it makes sense. Uh, Superman at this point had just joined the Justice League. I feel like I need to explain this part. So the reason why it's called Justice League America and not Justice League of America is that this is coming off of the Justice League International phase. And at this point, it had split into separate books at different parts of the world. So there's Justice League America, there's Justice League Europe, and then eventually there's other spinoffs, but the the, two, the big two are America and Europe uh, for this era of it all. Um, and Superman just joined because canonically, post-crisis, Superman was not a founding member of the Justice League. Hey, uh, right. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's okay. real weird. In yeah, that. okay. Because I was reading this one, and you know, on, on, you know, as a as something of a veteran comics reader, I am used to just sort of reading things and going, mm-hmm, okay, and just sort of you know carrying on as as though I fully understood what I just read. But that that does clear things, some things up. I wondered what the yeah. fuck they were talking about. <laughs> so, and, and we've got a weird roster on this team at the moment. And the the, the way, yeah. if you don't know what who this roster is, the way they explain this, because they know that this is going to be put in a trade paperback with a bunch of Superman stuff, and no one's going to know what the hell's going on here. Uh, they have Superman being interviewed by Cat Grant about the Justice League, so he can explain who the members of the Justice League are to anyone who's just joining this this yeah. particular crossover, mm-hmm. because they know they they know. <laughs> I was I I like as as much as I was like ah thank you for explaining who all of these characters are I thought it was very I thought it was very well done I I really yeah. enjoyed the kind of split narrative of the Cat Grant interview and the Justice League discovering slash fighting Doomsday it's like really well balanced yeah like you can it's very cinematic the way they would do the yeah. that kind of back and forth right yeah. there and it makes sense that Superman wouldn't be there as a result because. Yeah, he's on he's on this thing. They, they there's this whole like idea that like the interview is in in part some sort of educational program. They have like a bunch of high schoolers there to ask him questions. So it's a charity thing. And then the Justice League is responding to a monster, but you know, there's no actual report on like how big of a deal that is at the moment. And while this is not anyone's iconic Justice League, it's not a bad roster. Yeah. No. Uh, so at this point on the Justice League, we've got Fire and Ice, who are elemental themed superhero superheroines, uh, fire turns into fire. Uh, <laughs> ice is able to create ice, like that. The, it's cool powers in that. And, so, and their names are fire. Yeah, and- yeah, I know, right? Wow. <laughs> That's good writing. Yeah. That's good writing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, their, their names used to be more complex. It was Ice Maiden and uh, I think it was like Green Flame or something. And then they they, they simplified it when they became sort of the, this iconic duo on this team. Um, they were like, we, need, we need to brand a lot better if we're going to be yeah. on this team. Well, part of it is that Ice is 
So in much the same way that Donna Troy is a fuck up by editorial, Ice was also a fuck up by, by editorial where they thought it was a pre-existing character na- named Ice Maiden. And then they realized like, oh, wait, she's actually out of action. And that's why they had to like <laughs> split her into a separate. Her name had to be changed because there was already a character named Ice Maiden uh, is long story short. Um, and Oops. they just didn't realize that there were two women with ice powers in the DC. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, then we got Booster Gold, who hey. is everyone's favorite hey. uh, fuck up of a superhero. <laughs> Fame <The> war. <laughs> I love. Uh, and where there's Booster Gold, we've got Blue Beetle, uh, specifically the Ted Cord Blue Beetle at this point. We've got Guy Gardner, who most people know as a Green Lantern. This is during a phase where he had been kicked out of the Green Lantern Corps, but he had Sinestro's power ring. Yeah, I was oh. curious about that. I was like, I was like cause they, they mentioned him being kicked out. I'm like, but he's, got, he's still got a ring. Yeah, that's, yellow. What, that's why it's yellow. That's what I thought, too. <laughs> yeah. So he had Sinestro's power ring, and this is before he realized that he was also part alien uh, and able to make guns out of his hands. Oh, my God. That's right. That looks so weird, guys. <laughs> yeah, they're so weird. Slight, slight tangent. Uh, one of the first comics I was ever given to own was Green Lantern Rebirth number one by Jeff Johns. And, oh and yeah, I've like, why? Right. Um, yeah. It's like, here's all this retcon. Yeah. Like, yeah. He, he, like, I don't know what the con is. What can you ret? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and also here's only this one issue. No, you don't get the rest of the story. <laughs> but you know, like you, like your uncle just like gives you a comic and you know, you're like 10. So whatever. Um, and Guy Gardner is in that. And um, I, I think through like the cartoons, I knew that Guy Gardner was like, green lantern or or whatever and in that he is he gets like killed or like injured in an explosion and his whole body like kind of turns in inside out and he has like guns all over him reading that as a kid i was like what the fuck is happening what the hell is this i was so yeah that's the guy garner warrior phase yeah (laughs) yeah didn't didn't discover any context behind anything that was happening for like until for years later. <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, yeah. So yeah, Guy Gardner, who canonically had a concussion and that's why he's a douchebag, is is for uh, at this point a former Green Lantern with Sinestro's ring. But it's before the Sinestro core existed. So this is back when the ring was just a weapon from Cord, the antimatter universe that hated fucking Green Lanterns. Uh, and specifically, this green this ring is powered by fighting green lanterns uh so it draws power from there's like a whole like there's a whole canon way it works with like the later stuff where it's like oh fear versus will something 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 but at this point specifically he has to fight green lanterns for it to stay powered and at this point it's not really an issue because there's a lot of green lanterns around in a very short period of time that is going to change and all of a sudden that ring is not going to work anymore um but at this point still still works fine he's got effectively a green lantern ring but none of the yellow weaknesses (laughs) Uh, and then we've got the two actual heavy hitters. And that saying that the guy with the Sinestro core ring is not one of the heavy hitters is a big statement because we've got Maxima, mm-hmm. who is if Wonder Woman was psychic and also living in a Game of Thrones reality is the easiest way to explain this one. She is the she is this alien queen who her her line is all about breeding with the strongest aliens so that their bloodline can be as strong as possible mm-hmm. uh which is fucking cool i actually dig that part like she she's mostly known for trying to rape superman mm-hmm. not as cool well, <laughs> like, that, that's less cool uh, i think we can all yeah. agree that that's less cool right that that part's less cool uh but that's that's her shtick and she can she has consistently held her own with superman at, at this point she's she's, yeah, maybe, like maybe, she's she's maybe not as considered and as thought out as superman as as you know as we do see later <laughs> Right. <laughs> so she's but she she's definitely a powerhouse in the DCU. Like she's got strength and speed and durability enough to fight Superman, plus vast telekinetic abilities and vast telepathic abilities. She's like Jean Grey if she was also Wonder Woman <laughs> is, is the basic part there. Uh, and, that, and that's not too bad. And then we've got Bloodwind. And I have a question for the two of you. Do you know who Bloodwind Never. is? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. And I, 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 when you mentioned, I was like, he's going to fucking ask if we know who he is. No, I think I, for some reason in my head, because there's there's a there's a panel where um, I I can't remember who it is off the top of my head. They see Bloodwind like you know injured or whatever, and it, it you know it's like oh, I see now that Bloodwind is, and then it cuts. You know, yeah. And for some reason, I was like, ah, oh, well, that's fine. Like we'll find out who he is by the end. 
We don't. I have no, no idea. <laughs> I have absolutely no All idea. Right. I feel like it's a character that we know. Yes, you do. You you do. So let me let me explain this one because this one's a weird one, but actually relevant here. <laughs> so at this point in JLA, they had been running this whole story about who is this mystery member who just joined. He's really fucking strong. Like that's really weird. Um, everyone's like that. That's strange. Who, he's so powerful, but he's so vague about all of his powers and so forth. It's John Jones. Oh, what? Wait, what? it's the Martian Manhunter. Oh, but wasn't okay, but. <laughs> But why? Okay, so at this point, so here's the other part, which is that Bloodwind is also a separate character. <laughs> um, it is revealed that the blood that the entity Bloodwind, who is this human mystic who draws his power from the spiritual realm, had been trapped inside of his ruby that he wears on his chest normally, and that that had become bonded to Jean Jones. So he was being he was sharing a mental space kind of Thor style or firestorm style or however you want to talk about it. Um, but actually all of his powers are strictly speaking the Martian Manhunter powers at this point. He's just acting as an avatar, although he still has all of his, his Jean Jones memories as well. And so Bloodwind is operating through him, but it's, it's like a symbiotic situation. And that's why Comics. when he gets thrown into the fire, Am I and right? Bl- Blue Beetle. Yeah. Blue Beetle goes after him and it's like, like what? No, that makes sense. It's because he was in fire, and so he had reverted to his Martian form, <laughs> and so that's still being teased at this point. But like, that's that, that's what's going on. Uh, okay, that makes sense. That's, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Honestly, that does make sense. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. So here's actually like this issue. I think is honestly the most interesting part of the broader. What are we doing in terms of like what players are involved? Kind of phase because it has the most superheroes. Of you know, like they'll, yeah. they'll keep coming at a certain point. But like, <laughs> Blue Beetle is put into a coma. Booster Gold is put in is not into a coma, but his his out like his his uh, uniform is totally destroyed, um, which his uniform is his power source because it's actually like a super advanced yeah. like, future armor. Um, it's totally destroyed. And that's an issue for like the next like five years of, of uh, Booster Gold books where that's why he's like in the 90s always has these like Iron Man style armors because those are like the best attempts that Blue Beetle has had at approximating the future tech for Booster Gold. I was going to ask. I was like, OK, because hey, yeah, because, you know. Blue Beetle's been around for forever, and he's constantly jumping around. Uh, not uh, but Booster Gold, sorry, Booster Gold's always jumping around, time shenanigans, fun stuff. But uh, I was like, wait, but his his suit is his is the power thing, and I was like, plus I don't see Skeets here. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with Skeets at this point in time. I mean, he just might not be shown in this in this particular book because um, I don't remember exactly like what if, if Skeets was gone for a while or something like that. Um, it's also just possible that he didn't accompany him because he wasn't in every jail I story either. Thinking back to like the, the De Mateus Giffen McGuire run. Like mm-hmm. he's a, he's around, but I, I don't fully remember if he's just not, not present for this scene where booster gold gets beaten. He up, was probably at a dentist appointment. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> it's so important for those robot helpers. To exactly. Exactly. Their, their exactly. Done. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I was getting um, a root canal. <laughs> 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 but the reason why I think this is interesting is because so on the one hand, it's a shame that we don't have like the classic JLA to show off just like how rough this fight is. It, yes. But on the other hand, it's not a bad roster in terms of who's fighting Doomsday. Yeah. If you know who who's going like what's going on with this yeah. team, mm-hmm. uh, like in terms of setting up like, oh, yeah, Doomsday is real hardcore. Like. Because you could easily, like, for one thing, Bloodwind is just Martian Manager. So f- full stop, that, mm-hmm. that that one works right there. You know, Guy Gardner is a Green Lantern, even if it's a yellow ring at the moment. He, there's no power difference there. Uh, so it's just like, yep, all right, that's that's one-to-one right there. Maxima fills in really well for Wonder Woman. Yep. That works really well. You could easily see Blue Beetle and Batman being interchangeable yep. for the mm-hmm. purposes of sure, this yep. story. Uh, like, right down to, like, okay, well, they're using the Blue Beetle, like, the giant beetle to... Yep or yeah. mechanical beetle to f- travel. It could have just been a bad theme thing. You know, it doesn't matter. Like they're, the, they're cut from the same cloth of being like billionaire tech person. Also good fight guy. <laughs> Acrobat. Like what an elevator pitch for Batman though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there's billionaire a tech, Night Owl, fight guy. who's a direct ripoff of blue, Be- not direct ripoff, but like who's directly inspired by blue beetle. Uh, why everyone thinks he's a Batman clone because it's the, the, the line is blurred right there. You know, booster gold is, not a not a slouch in terms of his actual combat. Really like, yeah, but it's you know, it's all like tech stuff. So it's like hard to really quantify 
where like one of the big seven he, he would be equivalent to. And Fire and Ice are both like interesting energy casters mm. that are pretty typical for the JLA roster. Like you could easily see like Zatanna being like a stand in for for Ice Maiden at, at yeah. this point, you know, like like if, if Doomsday had some sort of workaround for her powers or wasn't it, you know whatever situation you wanted to put in there. You could have put like a, a more classic Justice League roster and then it would be timeless and we would all be like, man, it's really fucked up that they just tore through the Justice League like that. But on the <laughs> other hand, they're allowed, this also allows them to have Doomsday be this threat against a real, against real opponents. Hmm. You know, they're like, none of these are like slouches in, in that category, but at the same time, they can be destroyed and not have someone being like, Batman would have had prep time for this monster. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, cause like, imagine like, like, at this point, Wally West could only run at the speed of sound uh, because of him being injured Lame. in Crisis on Infinite Earths. And this is around the time that, that the death of Barry Allen story arc occurred, which is when he w- regained his ability to run at the speed of light. Um, so Doomsday, if if this is pre the death of Barry Allen story arc, Doomsday would have just murdered Wally West. Full stop. Because Doomsday is mo- like one thing that they emphasize is that Doomsday is super fucking fast. Like he is so fast that Superman has a hard time keeping up with him yeah. in a fight. Like that's a thing we talked about when we looked at the animated Superman Doomsday that I said was really good. Because like that's the thing about Doomsday. It's not just that he's the Hulk with claws. It's that he is a super fast character in this reality of super speedsters. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna fight the Martian Manhunter, you need to be fast enough that the Martian Manhunter can't keep up with you, and mm-hmm. the Martian Manhunter can run around the planet in less time than it takes you to blink. <laughs> like, <laughs> so we you, like we need to like establish that scale. Now, admittedly, Blood Wind is like not not a known quantity at this point, so people aren't really that clear about it. But Maxima is like she very much so is, and so is Guy Gardner. Mm-hmm. So we can establish Doomsday is real fucking tough if he's able to punch through Guy Gardner's force fields. <laughs> if he's able to punch Booster Gold so hard that his flight ring isn't able to stop the flight. Yeah, yeah. I this this um this, this like this whole fight does like such a good job of establishing like some re- just really strong stakes and just it, it has such a good arc from. And I don't mean like a story arc. I mean like an arc of like tension from the beginning to the end, and and it goes over into the into the next issue as well with like the the house and the the the, the threat of that family, um, mm-hmm. of going from like oh like oh this is a bit of a tough fight to oh my god fighting for our lives we've all been destroyed like what is like what's gonna happen next oh shit it like the the arc of that is so so well crafted. Yeah, and that's that's another thing that's really nice that they start setting up like human stakes as well. You know, we've got bystanders in general, but we also have specifically humans that are there on the scene. We got that teenager and then his family. I love that the teenager fucking hates Superman. <laughs> I know it's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this issue, most of the questions we get, aside from like the the joke questions, where it's like, "Man, fire is hot. It, do you think she's really hot, Superman?" And it's like, "I respect her as a woman." Moving on to the next question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but like a lot of the questions are like, Hey, like, what are your thoughts on like, why is there so much violence? And like, these mm. are meta commentaries about comics in general, specifically yeah. a comic that is going to be ultimately just a knockdown drag on fight between Superman and someone. Uh, and it's like, unfortunately, when we talked about man of steel, the John Byrne arc, we did say that this era of Superman has big cop energy relative to like most versions yeah. of Superman. So like, <laughs> there's a little bit of a, like violence is a necessary evil of the job. And if, if we didn't do violence, humanity would have you know greater trouble yada 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 um i do like though that they address it yeah yeah like that part is good yeah i i it, it like and, and and as well like it's just that what i was talking about before like having the two storylines kind of separately and having the it the, there's something very uh i guess philosophical but also kind of amusing where there's like the the girl who stands up who obviously is supposed to be like you know liberal hippie type and she's like oh but you know what if we like love everyone and you know do you always have to be fighting and superman's like oh well you know like i'd i'd love to not to but sometimes you just gotta punch really hard and then the next panel is like (laughs) guy gardner like getting his kidneys taken out the side and and (laughs) you know them going through like a a petrol tanker and stuff and and, you know there there is there is something partially philosophical about that and also kind of funny (laughs) yeah that you have this hard yeah, cut I mean, from peace and love to, you know, 
Yeah, I mean, like in the in the grand scheme of things, like at this point, Superman, ha- you know, for one thing, hasn't done anything in this issue. In the in the pre- the previous issue, he, you know, while he like ripped up some machinery, he didn't really get in, like, really didn't hurt anyone too bad. Aside from at one point, the concrete uh, claw guy, he put the grenade in his mouth. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but very clearly, he Which wasn't. He killed. didn't know wasn't going to hurt him. I thought at the time. I know. <laughs> <laughs> You don't know. What, I didn't see that. You, you don't know that he's invulnerable on the inside. You're just guessing here, my dude. <laughs> yeah. Let's put a grenade in the concrete yeah, face guy. He just, like, he just blows apart into bloody chunks, and Superman's like, "Oh, yeah, it's just shrapnel oh and murders God. everyone else." <laughs> <laughs> no one can ever know about this. <laughs> but I, I do appreciate that they are trying to at least address that. Like, yeah, no, violence is not great. Like Superman says, he really doesn't like that. It, violence is a part of the job, but that he participates in it for a greater good and that there is a, a cost to it. Like they, they're they putting their life on the line in some cases. And at this point, Superman has fought Mongol. He's fought Darkseid. Like there, there is no question that there are things out there that could beat him in a fight. It's just that we haven't gotten to a fight where it was only going to end one way. That's called foreshadowing. Uh, and that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, Superman looks directly... <laughs> down the barrel of the camera and goes well i've had a lot of fights but i've never died no one has ever experienced the death of superman can you imagine if you only read justice league america and you didn't read any of these other books and just the next issue is like man it's really fucked up that superman died yeah (laughs) wait what (laughs) what did i miss I think they come back and it's like a totally different roster because so many people like on their team have been mortally wounded they're just all in comas (laughs) Pretty much. I mean, Blue Beetle is like in a coma for a little bit. Booster Gold is out of action for a while. It's it's not a it's not a good look for most of them. <laughs> I mean, Ice Ice gets hurt. Her, she gets wrecked and gets stomped on by James Dacre. <laughs> I mean, she should be down for a count too. Yeah, pr- pr- pretty much all of them uh, take a beating. At one point, they they like set up fire as having like burned out her flame. Yeah. Uh, although that happens in the next issue. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Some 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 consequences. Uh, so we pick up with the next issue, which is G- Superman, no subtitle, which is the other Dan Jurgens book. So it picks up directly there. So art style kind of stays about the same because it's Dan Jurgens doing doing the art. And then he has backup team like doing finishes, uh, which is a pretty common practice for for artists where they'll do like basic layouts and then they'll do like faces. But then like someone else will like go through and actually like put in like the costume details and stuff. Side note, uh, Maximus costume here is this like kind of weird green very uh, exposed kind of look. She's got like a, a midriff cut out and then like also part of her boob is exposed. And somehow that's not the skankiest outfit she's ever worn. Uh, she's got one <laughs> where the first time I ever saw it, I was like, wait, so do do they expect women just to have like socks for where their boobs go? Because it was like a Dan Jurgens drawn. <laughs> it was like her all purple outfit, but somehow it looked like basically she was just naked. And I'm like, it, this was the, this was the, this was the character that made me start to understand the concept of male gaze. <laughs> <laughs> and we're probably not going to talk about that issue because that's part of Superman Doomsday, um, the comic arc. <laughs> but, but it's a uh, yeah, uh, it's a, just a weird thing for that character. Um, oh, but I'm but I'm sure there's some deep lore explanation as to why she has to, she just has to dress like that. <laughs> well, yeah, you know because the the most powerful warrior queens also boobs uh, <laughs> no that's that's exactly what it is the most powerful warrior yes, queens, boobs, yes boobs like yes case you're a man of you're a man of culture and knowledge uh but this issue focuses more on that that teenager we were talking about mitch and then his family uh who man he's a shitbag yeah though. i like honestly <laughs> if, if mitch had died i would have been like well rip i guess but okay <laughs> yeah He's such an asshole. He's so mean to his mom. So mean, like for no reason either. I I was waiting because he's like he's what it what uh man what a dump. I hate this hole. And then and then I was like okay like the mom's gonna be like real mean and then you know maybe they'll bond over this. And she's like Mitch dear is that you? And she's like help yourself to the fridge. How was school? Did you do well in your? And he's like fuck you and fuck this and I want soda and dad's <laughs> cool and I'm like Jesus what happened in this home? Yeah, he calls it a war zone before he arrives, and it, and it's just her feeding the baby, You're right? And it's because she, because she doesn't have enough soda in the fridge. <laughs> it's like dad always has enough soda for me at his apartment. I'm like, is this what is this what teens wanted in the '90s? Do they just want soda? Yes. 
Yes. That's yeah. all they wanted. Like he's so he is so shitty to her where where it's like, like, did you like meeting Superman? It's like, well, I bet if you like if you were less awful, like dad wouldn't have left you. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then she starts crying and then he feels bad, but he never says sorry. No. <laughs> like, no. He's just, he's like, I'm going over to my friends, see ya. <laughs> uh, uh yeah. And then nothing bad happens to him. And then Ice gets tossed through the, their house. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> And Doomsday picks up their car one-handed, uh, to hit, to which his response is, like, that dude did all this with one hand tied behind his back? Check it out. <laughs> Check it out. Wow, this is crazy Radical. stuff. And it's like, yeah, I feel like your reaction is uh, a little understated and not really directed well. I, I mean, I will admit that Mitch is supposed to be here the type of fan of comics that – he's a stand-in for that, like this type of fan of comics. That is literally why we do this show, which is mm-hmm. the, like – Superman's not badass enough. He doesn't hurt people enough. He's not cool enough uh, type of like comic fan who especially was prevalent in the 90s. And like why we got this extreme era that would like then have additional commentary when we get to the reign of the Superman part of this whole story. Like here and like part of the arc is Mitch coming to understand like, no, it's good to have someone who will save you when you're in a fire. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But up at first, like, he's just shitting on Superman at every point. Superman, like, takes a punch from Doomsday, and he's like, if he was a better superhero, he would have dodged. I I just laughed when I read that, because it, it was a big deal. The spud was too slow and stupid to duck. And it's like, what are you talking about? Right. Well, so Superman tanks a punch from Doomsday, and, like, it's a really impressive punch. They're all like, wow, that, that punch would have really done something. I am curious. Like, I realize Doomsday is super fast, and there was probably a really loud sound when Doomsday punched him. But they're like, man, it's impressive that Superman didn't, like, even budge when, when that guy hit you. I'm like, if, if a normal guy hit Superman, it, it wouldn't budge, and it might have also been, like, fairly loud. Like, I don't know how you yeah. can like, gauge super strength in that <laughs> scenario. Yeah. Uh, but then immediately following that up, uh, Doomsday gives uh, Superman a really hard kick and actually sends him through the house and completely destroys it. And we get, you know, thought bubbles from Superman being like, I'm don't, I've never been hit this hard. And then Booster Gold is getting his ass whipped because <laughs> again, <Gold. laughs> hey, 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 we will not slander the name Booster Gold here, sir. <laughs> man, it's a legend. <laughs> Booster Gold was like, man, I loved that first ass kicking so much. Time for a second round. Woo. Time, time for another. Um, then Doomsday goes in and he hits Ice while she's down. Fortunately, Ice is like kind of a demigoddess of, of Ice Elemental being so this is why she's able to survive she's like much much as Iceman over at marvel is an omega level mutant who can fight norse gods uh ice is also actually in that category she's just not very confident (laughs) so she's not there yet at this point oh my relatable (laughs) amazing but just not very confident (laughs) anyway doomsday then tries to go murder the baby and that's when the justice league shows up and they all try to do they they all pour it on they like all use all their energy blasts so much so that that's when fire like runs out of her flame and like guy Gardner's eyes are so swollen shut from being just pounded by doomsday that he can't even see straight uh and run like all the power runs out on on booster gold's uh suit all all this stuff and all that results in is us being able to see part of doomsday's face and then for the shackle that was still holding one of his arms behind his back to be broken. And that's it. Doomsday just got tougher. <laughs> and he immediately tears through the group. Well, I'm glad they sure spent all that power trying to do literally nothing. Because um, I also I also love uh, that they're like pouring all this on and it cuts to Mitch. who's like, wow, Guy Gardner's face is beaten so puffy that he can't even see. And he's still in there <laughs> fighting. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, he loves Guy Gardner. This, yeah, like this fucking just, guy. He loves it. Yeah, and he's like, "Wow, he looks like shit." I love him. That's so awesome. Yeah, when when his mom is about when his mom and his baby sibling are about to be burned up in a, in a fire, he's like looking around, and being like, "Fire's out, ice is out, Booster Gold, the the blood guy, even Guy Gardner, the only one who can save us, Superman." <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is where we get like a little bit of a, a moral conundrum going on here, which is that Doomsday leaping to the next massacre that he's about to do superman's in hot pursuit what's he gonna do and it's like if i let him if i let him go way more people are gonna die but i can hear the kids screaming and that is a good conundrum right there like that but it does feel like a little i mean yeah, yeah. It's, it's a it's a little put on but i think it like it's a good encapsulation of like the classic superman dilemma where it's like 
if he pushed himself, he, like he probably could have caught Doomsday and and you know maybe could have saved countless lives. But this kid and his family are dying in this burning building, and he is like calling out to him, Superman, please save me. And Superman can save him. So what is he going to choose? And I feel like it's yeah, it's a little you know the hands a little heavy, but the. I feel like it's a good encapsulation. And, and this is where it gets kind of rough when you compare it to the next issue, because like the the art shift and the, the momentum kind of changes. So it does like even though it's still Doomsday's flying through the air, or I should say leaping through the air, although there's like a little bit of a curl effect. Yeah. So which kind of looks like Superman, but it's also kind of tied up in Superman's flight. Yeah. It's hard to really say like what's going on when you pick up the next issue and Superman catches him, throws him into a lake and then goes back and saves the kid. So like that can none, you know, it, it, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know yeah. how hard they came down on either side of the issue. Cause he still kind of did both. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 um, I remember reading it like, like freshly, like, fr- like freshly reading it just, just for this and being like, wow. Oh, geez. The stakes have really been like ramped up for the end of this. And then the start of it, it does, it does fizzle a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but this is where we cut over to the adventures of Superman. Now, this book was this book's side note is actually the the classic Superman book. The the reason why the numbering on it is 497 is because when Crisis on Infinite Earths happened and they gave the, the series over to John Byrne to reboot everything, um, they rebranded the existing Superman book from Superman to the Adventures of Superman, which has often been his subtitle for things like the radio show and, and some of his cartoons uh, have actually been called the Adventures of Superman. Uh, And then they launched the new Superman book. But the currently running book in the real world, where we exist now in September of 2022, the book that is Superman that has a crazy high number, that is this series here. So at this point, it's being written by Jerry Ordway, who I love. He he did the Power of Shazam relaunch in the the 90s, which is a series that I love so much. Um, He's also a great artist and was previously the artist on this book. Um, And he it but the book, the artist on this book at this point is Tom Grummet, uh, who I adore. <laughs> I think that the, of all the art in in the Death of Superman story, the Tom Grummet stuff is just like the most aesthetically pleasing. Like he just draws really pretty people. <laughs> I agree with you guys. Looks a lot better than the last episode or last issue did. <laughs> yeah, uh, but this is this is the issue where we start getting the the thing that's really interesting about the arc that only I didn't realize only starts here, uh, beca- but which is that. Every page has four panels in this issue. And then the next issue is going to go down to three and then the two. And then Superman 75, the actual death issue, is entirely splash pages. So it Fuck. A that's true. Shit. Oh, wow. So I think that's a really cool <laughs> element. That did you, so, did, I, 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 Case, did you, did you read this somewhere or did you just notice that? This is a thing I've always known, but I can't remember if I read an article or if I noticed it at the time. I because it because this was even though I didn't read this at, at the immediate point, I still read this by like 1995. So I'm like not really sure. I I'm going to assume that Wizard mentioned it or someone mentioned it, and that's how I know about it. But oh my god, I'm sorry, I'm I'm flipping through now. That is crazy. Yeah, and it's hard to tell in this issue, but it's the next issue where it all of a sudden becomes because they'll awkwardly insert. Uh, additional panels like like sub panels on the page to keep the three every time yeah <laughs> uh and they and they consider like uh two page spreads one page for the purpose of this all yeah um, so like the the after the first page there's a two page spread and that's one giant panel of superman punching doomsday and then three panels of the fire with mitch and so on and so forth wow but yeah so we're still dealing with with the gosh the the doomsday stuff <laughs> at this point. Uh, there is a spot where I'm pretty sure that they were not aware that Bloodwind was Martian Manhunter for the team working on this book because he oh, he's, like moves a bunch of flaming He's rubbish. in the burning building. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And Superman's like, are you okay? And Bloodwind's like, yeah, I actually love fire. It's my favorite. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, it honestly should have been the reverse. It should have been Superman pushing it and then Bloodwind like, moves them away um and i just i just think that that was a a thing dan jurgens was doing in justice league america that he didn't mention because we'll talk when we get to the end of this all like the the more recent trades show like how they tried to map out everything going on between all the different books and 
it is a maddening uh, whiteboard of just like details to try to keep going <laughs> across, across the board. It's like, all right, so Lois is upset here. And this is, you know, because, you know, again, four different Superman books, plus a, a crossover with Justice League, like that they're trying to tell across like, what what is this, eight issues total? <laughs> Like it's wild. I, I, uh, seven, yeah, it's. I, uh, I, 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 I do not. I do not envy the, the whoever's job it was to try and keep track of all this. Yeah. So this is Doomsday, like working his way towards Metropolis, um, or at least, or just tearing through the the country. I guess is really more accurate at this point. And we're seeing the collateral damage. The Justice League is not able to keep up. Superman's the only one doing anything. You know, Maxima shows up at one point and like does okay but isn't really able to do too much but we do start to check in again with everyone over in metropolis like we hadn't really been following where lois was at this point um and now it's like oh there's a big story going on let's go get jimmy who is filming turtle boy the tv show (laughs) (laughs) Uh, i think that's a lot of fun we also check in with lex luther jr and supergirl he's not here yeah that was um that was interesting (laughs) So. Didn't realize he was Lex Luthor Jr. until after I finished the uh, the whole thing. Except he's not, because he's actually Lex Luthor Sr., but he cloned himself and then put his brain inside that body. <laughs> How much of weird, guys? Yeah, I, sh- I should have figured that one out. My bad. <laughs> and then also pretended to be Australian. Okay, uh, why- Okay, that's the most fucked up thing he's ever done. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why the panel's, like, his first appearance, he just says, bloody! <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> Okay, sure. Why not? Sure, sure. I'm sure, too weird, not? guys. I'm yeah. too weird. Yeah. So at this point, so again, this is this is only six years after Man of Steel. So Lex Luthor had the Kryptonite Ring as his way of keeping Superman at bay. He's a big, rich person. Found out that the that the Kryptonite was giving him cancer, and so he faked his own death, and then uh, through kind of through through assets that he had already and bizarro tech and whatnot and financial ties to cadmus <laughs> he had them grow him a new body that he put his brain into and he very explicitly was like i needed to have as much hair as possible uh <laughs> that's why he's so furry in this all uh because they genetically modified him that's the only major thing they did to him they only <laughs> just made it so that he would be like really really furry uh, so he's got this long flowing red luscious hair uh, <laughs> um and that's that's that shtick. And, th- uh, and then they subliminally programmed him to have an Australian accent so he could pretend that he was his own bastard son who had grown up in Australia so that he could pretend to be a good guy who just happened to, like, luck into his father's fortune and take over with his father dead. So there's that. Comics are, are serious entertainment, and the stories that they tell uh, should be considered <laughs> sacred and sacrosanct, I think. <laughs> now, here is why Supergirl is sitting on his lap. <laughs> Cannot wait to hear this one. <laughs> so, so this is the '90s Supergirl. This is at this point the the character is her secret identity. She doesn't have a secret identity. Uh, it her name is Matrix or or May for short. When she was raised by the Kents for a little while, she was called May Kent. Um, she is a clone of Lana Lang from another reality that was artificially given or, or or rather she's an artificial construct that was give, imprinted with Lana Lang's uh, appearance and DNA, but also able to shapeshift and sent from this other reality, which J Mike was the pocket universe that Superboy came from post-crisis. Uh-huh. If you'll recall the death of Superboy story that we talked about. Uh, so from that reality, she was created by in that reality, the good Lex Luthor, because in that reality, that Silver Age Lex Luthor never had his hair blown off of him by Superboy and thus never went bad. And so when Zod and his allies decided or like got free from the Phantom Zone and attacked the world, Lex Luthor set up a force field around Smallville that pro- pro- protected them while the Kryptonians uh, bombarded the planet from orbit uh, until all life was dead on this alternate reality Earth. And in this this bubbled city of Smallville, Lex Luthor took the DNA of the now dead Lana Lang imprinted some of her memories on this artificial construct he created called the matrix programmed her to then instead of looking like Lana Lang to go blonde and have slightly different features and then sent her to the other reality where Superman is from uh, to bring him back over to help save the day. 
he he gets recruited. They they go. Everything goes bad. The Superman has to kill the Kryptonians. It's a really it's a it's a rough scene. People talk about this one a lot. Like every time they're like <laughs> Superman doesn't kill. They're like, well, what about this scene where Superman is like has a thing of green kryptonite that he just aims at Zod until <laughs> Zod is dead. Um, that's the that's the scene there. Um, <laughs> She comes back with him, but she's all kind of fucked up because she found out that she wasn't really Lana Lang, even though she was convinced she had been Lana Lang. So she doesn't really know who she is. So for a while, she decided to live as a non-binary entity, which I think is actually kind of dope and was not a thing they were really thinking about at the time. Um, For a period when Superman went into exile, she decided to masquerade as Clark Kent to sort of like present or to keep this facade that Clark Kent was still out there. And then she was like, you know what? That's not real. Like, I don't really feel like that's me. And then kind of decided that Supergirl really was who she was. And then she met Lex Luthor Jr., who looks just like the man who made her. So she imprinted on him like some sort of lovesick puppy uh, and (laughs) then became his lover and private security person. That's a lot. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Yep. So when people are like, so how did you guys meet? Like, do they condense that? Or- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So at this point, her superpowers are she can shapeshift. She's super strong and can fly and is functionally invulnerable. And then she can go invisible and she has telekinesis. So she's she's tough, but she's not, you know, quite Superman level. On, uh, but she, she's she's pretty good. Um, later, when after she merges with a dying girl she loses those shape-shifting powers but because of this weird fusion of being this artificial entity as well as this like tortured human soul uh, she becomes an earthborn angel with wings of fire uh who's able to shoot fire from her eyes uh for a period of time until they get separated and then that entity goes off and becomes an actual angel in heaven um and then possibly the star of peter david's book fallen angel but then that kind of the, he rewrites that when it leaves dc um and then the human girl becomes supergirl and that's the phase where she's wearing like the outfit from the animated series the white top with the like mini skirt and the our girl whatnot uh yeah uh, so that's yeah. that supergirl right there <laughs> it's real weird <laughs> yeah, like i said comics are weird guys <laughs> yeah wow yeah. that was <laughs> comics that was a tangent Jeez. Jeez Louise. So that's me explaining what this first panel of Lex Luthor and Supergirl are. Uh, but so Lex Luthor is pretending to be a good guy. He has like a, a fleet of armed people that he actually sends for crisis prevention and and uses Supergirl for that. It's all good publicity stuff. He's trying to be like very much a hero. Even Superman thinks he's a hero at this point. Like that's that is a running theme at this point because no one knows that he's actually Lex Luthor Sr. Um, but he is actually Lex Luthor Sr. So – he manipulates Supergirl not to go help Superman, hoping that the monster will kill him. Mm-hmm. Even yeah. though he doesn't really think there's a chance because he's like, Superman always gets away. <laughs> kind of stuff. That, that um, tricky Lex Luthor. Oh, <laughs> what a kid. Yeah, so Maxima catches up to Superman and Doomsday, and the three of them have, like, a pretty knockdown drag out fight in middle America. Like, they... like whatever like this little like town in new jersey or whatever they're in like is completely destroyed uh, ultimately there's like a gas rupture <laughs> it's bad no i have yeah <laughs> yeah the ihop closes so you know things are bad there's no ihop and train fields everywhere darn <laughs> uh, but this is really the the collateral damage issue uh that we're seeing like yeah the, everyone's becoming aware of things uh people are getting hurt real bad uh, it's all it's all kind of bloody th- things exploding. And then uh, after this bomb burst that even knocks out Superman, uh, the Guardian shows up. Okay, who is this guy? Yeah. OK. OK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, hey, man, what's up? And then just kind of carried on reading. But the whole time I was like, who the fuck is this dude? So the Guardian, man, th- this is why I'm the way I am about comics, because like I th- I had the same questions then and then was like, well, I guess I have to buy every comic and understand. <laughs> 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 The, the Guardian is a Jack Kirby creation from the 40s who uh, was because Jack Kirby liked having acrobats who had shields it was his basic deal. And the Guardian specifically was a guardian of these the newsboy legion. So it was like a, a group of young boy orphans uh, that this guy would just like protect. Uh, the newsboy legion would go on to grow up and become scientists at Cadmus. And so they cloned the person who was the Guardian. To, and gave him a new life. And this is actually a, a test run for what a, what would be the Lex Luthor Jr. thing. Um, so he's basically a Captain America type character who lives in the DC universe. Um, and that's 
So that's the nutshell for this version of the Guardian. Uh, there have been other versions of the Guardians and other clones of Jim Harper, who, yes, his last name is Harper because he is the uncle of Roy Harper, a.k.a. Speedy Green, La- or Green Arrow's uh, sidekick. Of course he is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somehow, so Young Justice makes it, the the cartoon has this character, and they somehow both make it more complicated and less complicated, and I love it. Um, but, <laughs> but for suffice it to say, it's it's Captain America, but instead of being frozen in ice, they, they cloned his body, and that's why he's a young body now. Right. Yeah, and he works at, at Cadmus. He's their head of security. Moving on to action comics. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, this is written by Roger Stern and art by Jackson Geis? Juice? I don't know. It's juice with a G. With a G's. <laughs> Goose. Um, yeah. So this is where we get the, like, it's they're awkwardly making it three panels because Ooh. we've got the, the TV overlays to show while it's really just one big splash page. <laughs> but it is the three panel setup as we go. More Optimus Prime being destroyed by Doomsday. Uh, <laughs> R.I.P. to another trucker. And then, <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, so... This is where we get the the only hint that Doomsday actually has an objective, because while he's tearing through middle America, he goes to a Lexmart, which is Walmart, but owned by Lex Luthor. So less evil, technically, uh, <laughs> and sees a commercial talking about wrestling in Metropolis um, and somehow puts it all together when he actually sees a sign for where Metropolis is. Uh, he And he starts saying Metropolis. Um, and it's like, oh, well, he actually wants to go hurt a thing. But throughout this all, finally, Lois is on the scene in a news helicopter observing what's going on. We get some more about Lex Luthor tr- keeping Supergirl at bay. Um, and Doomsday just keeps on fucking up everything real bad. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that's a lot of this issue. But he's getting closer to Metropolis. And that's the, that is the thing, which is that so Superman intercepts him um, while he's like trying to actually get to Metropolis and, and throws him past Metropolis. So he crashes into like, I guess, their equivalent of Yonkers, uh, wherein Cadmus is located. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and inside inside the the because it's like this big national park that Cadmus is located underneath and inside of it like in in the woods there is a tree city that was created by some of the creations of Cadmus um this is all shit from the Jack Kirby run like at this era they love the Jack Kirby stuff they they're putting that in as much as they can and so Superman and Doomsday have a fight in this giant tree city which is such a dope visual uh and it's I wish so the cool. was like yeah. I, I wish that this was more of the setting for other issues. Like the Tom Grummet art is l- wasted on it just being like, yeah, we're having a fight in New Jersey. <laughs> like, <laughs> like here we're like, I, and like, you know, I, I'm sorry. I'm not, I, I keep saying New Jersey because I'm like making it the equivalent of New York. And it's that, that side of thing. It's more, it's the middle America stuff. Whereas like, this is just a giant treehouse fight. <laughs> like it's so fucking cool. <laughs> And they're like, the, all, all these trees are as sturdy as concrete. And so they're just like smashing each other with just giant, giant, giant trees. tree buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but Doomsday keeps keeps getting the upper hand. Like Doomsday is so fast and so strong and so durable. Um, and they don't talk about this at all in this all. But Doomsday is also venomous. Uh, so that's also occurring throughout this. Of whole course fight. he is. Of course yeah. he is. That's more of a retcon. But that that is is canonically one of his powers now to be venomous. Yeah. Like, yeah. If you get punched by him, you are getting poisoned and weakened as you go. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. Why not? Yeah. 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 <laughs> It's a it's it's a giant monster who can't be killed, who is grown from babies that they just kept murdering until they just stopped dying. <laughs> yeah, I suppose, I suppose I suppose that makes sense. Yeah, covered covered with spikes, and if he if he dies, he comes back to life, like immune to whatever killed him. So that's that, that's doomed to yeah yeah sure poison. <laughs> it's enough. Um, but. But yeah, so he he gets away from Superman because he actually causes this whole like forest city to collapse on Superman, and Superman's getting weaker. Like he's getting knocked up, knocked around. He's mm. having moments of like blacking out throughout this whole fight. So we're setting up that it's getting bad. And this is when we switch over back to Superman: The Man of Steel, uh, where it's now going to two panels, and Doomsday has shown up and fucks up a construction site. <laughs> yeah, he is just like he's just killing people. Yeah, there's 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 no uh, like he, you know accidental nothing accidental about this. He is killing people. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, absolutely. Like this is the prototype for stuff like the Ultimates Hulk arc when he like tears through New York and like the, in the wake of it they have to have a funeral for like 800 people. Like because these are giant disastrous events. Like 
<laughs> like super Superman is fighting a creature that is able to beat him and is in, solely intent on murdering things. So like, yeah, pe- people are definitely dying throughout this whole thing. Yeah. We do get confirmation that telepathy is not going to do much against him. Uh, Double X, who is a DNA alien from Cadmus, uh, contacts Guardian and is like, yep, no, my psychic powers are worthless against this thing. It is just destruction. <laughs> Um, and they use the two panel setup here, I think, pretty interestingly, whereas in the previous issue and the issue before, like it still felt like normal comics pages here. It's very clearly always like two scenes juxtaposed with each other. It's either we're trying to yeah. track a thing that's going on. We're cutting to, you know, we're finally seeing Superman's parents like Ma and Pa Kent. Uh, again, this is the era where Pa Kent is definitively alive. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Ma and Pa Kent are watching the news and being like, you know. The news is really making this a big story, but our son is getting beaten real bad. He's yeah. bleeding. And that's got to be weird if you're Ma and Pa Kent, where it's like, wait, Clark is like, has like, is swollen. He's got blood coming out of his lips and his eyes. Like, he's in bad shape. And if you've never seen your son that way, that's got to be weird. Wait, is yours blood? Or if it's mine, it's black. So is your, is your, color, the color of your blood red? In this printing, it appears to be black, but it's it's blood. Yeah, in my in mine, it's black, but yeah, it's it's, it's blood. It's blood. Yeah, it's, it's it's not it's not black sweat coming from his lips. <laughs> I mean, because like one of the other panels, like somebody gets smashed underneath a bolt, like a, a girder or something, and it's all black. I, mean, <laughs> so I should also note that this isn't weird that Superman bleeds at this time. While I'm saying it would be weird for Ma and Pa Kent to see it because it hasn't really been on the news. Superman has been beaten bloody by in fights with Mongol. He has been been beaten bloody in fights with Lobo, who they talk about in this issue. The, like there are physical threats in the DC universe that have have hurt Superman pretty bad at this point, but none so bad as what Doomsday does to the War Worlders when he crashes lands into the underworld. Uh, because again, even though these are all telling one giant story, each ish, each book has like their own subplots that they come back to. So this is the one where uh, it's like, oh yeah, the underworld stuff, like. Doomsday crash lands through the sewers of Metropolis and then just murders them all because he's a fucking monster. And like even the bad guys that we were dealing with last issue aren't as bad as this guy. Yeah. And he's so casual about it as well. There's no like they're like, oh, great. You're you're here. You can help us. And he's like, I'm sorry. No. (laughs) Yeah. Like they were fully ready to be his servants. And he's just like, nope, kill death. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Uh, Superman shows up. There's more of a fight. Things. The power plant that they were under explodes. Finally, Supergirl goes goes to join, and like, man, this is like the this is why like I am dismissive of Supergirl's power level versus Superman at this time because she goes, she hits Doomsday once, and he punches her into a puddle. Yeah. <laughs> Blash is the uh... yes, <laughs> like that is a hard visual. Like behind the scenes, so this is this uh, this episode we are recording a week after I put out a video about the Linda Danvers Matrix Supergirl, and like. You know, I had to use this panel because, like, I had to be like, "Yeah, she's not as strong as Superman." Here's <laughs> exactly why. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you can see in the next panel, she falls to the ground as the, as this purple goo with her eyes da- like they're like slug eyes, like yeah. just like <laughs> extended outwards on stalks as she, as she like falls to the ground. Imagine reading this as like an eleven year old, <laughs> no context to any of this. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, like, wow, cool. Supergirl's joining the fright. Wait, what? Hang on. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, if you didn't know that Supergirl was a protoplasmic being that could be reformed that way, you'd be like, what the fuck did he just do to her? Yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, even even now, reading it and having a vague idea of what's going on, it's still pretty fucking weird. Yeah. Uh, also, J. Mike, at the the shot right before that, Superman gets stabbed with one of Doomsday's uh, elbow claws yeah. because Doomsday has claws for every joint. Um, and like, yeah, it's all black, but it's like it's very clearly blood it's, gushing out of his stomach right there, and his face is very clearly bruised. I was like, oh like, man, they have a cannon. It's the purple ray. They have a. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's happening. It's finally yeah. happening. Yeah, so we get email Hamilton. Also with Bibbo Bavowski as his lab assistant, which I fucking like think is just adorable right there. Um, and I love that Emil Hamilton immediately is like, I think it's clearly a doomsday weapon being sent to attack us because like everyone settles on like, yep, this guy's named doomsday. Like, yeah. No question about it. <laughs> they try to use a gun. It doesn't do shit. And in fact, doomsday then like, I don't, I don't know how the physics on this one works. Like they shoot doomsday and he's in midair 
and he falls into them. So I guess he can control his landing. Yeah, but he can't you know, fly. He's, so I don't he's know strong. He's he's strong, so therefore he can. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, that or or something. Anyway, so he crash lands and destroys that branch of Star Labs right there, and they all have to jump off the building wearing force field belts. <laughs> and it was like, are you sure this is gonna survive? Like, this is gonna work? And it's like, yeah, it's a little late to be worried about that. We're falling <laughs> to our death if it doesn't. Maggie Sawyer and the uh, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, but it's, it's not SVU. <laughs> SVU. <laughs> Metropolis. Well, but it's like the Metropolis SVU. like SWAT team or whatever. I forget what they're called right now. They, they dun, dun, dun. like like inner gang stuff. So I was like, that yeah. was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, Dan Turpin and and Maggie Sawyer and and all those cops. They still start shooting Doomsday, and that does nothing because it's Doomsday. Um, then then the fight gets gets worse. Lex Luthor's people like fly in and just start shooting everyone. Um, and so we got a really badass shot of Doomsday and Superman just slugging it out with both of them getting pelted with lasers. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, and Superman, you know, we get this badass, like, this is where I hold the line. Um, dun, 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 we all know dun. it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all know how this is going to go. Because the next issue is infamously the death of Superman. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the the, co- the cover of the next issue really spells it out for you. Yeah, so this is Superman 75. This is the one that they did the black bagging for. This is the one that everyone knows is like, it's the death of Superman. The iconic cover is the is the cape float like on some random stick just sitting in the ground. <laughs> but but yeah, so this is where we get to it all being splash panels. Going back to like, did I know this or not? It uh, It is also possible that I knew about the splash pages and then like realized that there were the other ones leading up to it because... There's a there is a tradition in comics of doing an all splash panel issue for big fights. Um, the first one I can think of existing uh, is the Thor fight with uh, the Midgard Serpent that was done under Walt Simonson, uh, where the whole fight, amazing fight, where the whole fight is Thor and the serpent in, in all splash panels. Um, Eric Larson's talked about it for a lot of his big issues with Savage Dragon. So I was like familiar with that kind of convention there. So I don't, again, I'm not... I don't remember if I heard something or figured it out, but it's been 20 years. So it's or more, more. Oh my God. I'm so old. Sorry. <laughs> it's like 20 years, 20 years ago. I was out of college or I was out of high school. So uh, anyway, yeah. So big fight. We're back to Dan Jurgens as the artist. We were on all splash panels of Superman and doomsday fighting. Doomsday tosses Superman into the news helicopter, so that's why Lois and Jimmy are on the ground for this whole fight. And we kind of get the the scene from the co- or from the Superman Doomsday movie that we talked about, where Superman has to save the helicopter that they're in while Doomsday is there. Uh, this one feels less like, well, I'm just going to throw Doomsday into a building full of people. <laughs> <laughs> At least that doesn't happen. <laughs> There's so much smoke and debris that Superman's able to give Lois a kiss before running back into the fight. I mean, you got to make time for the priorities, <laughs> right? Right. Uh, but it's going on. L- like, no one can get free at this point. Like, no, ev- ev- everyone who's there can't get away from Doomsday because Doomsday is so fast and so destructive. Like, you can't run because he's just going to kill you because he's got that predator instinct going on. And we get some really good shots here. Like, Superman, like throwing his cape aside while like fi- like flame blasting and it's heat vision mind you not concussive force he's blasting doomsday into a wall that's got to be like him using like a lot of his reserves yep <laughs> uh but as this fight is going on every single time doomsday hits superman at this point now his invulnerability is not holding up so all of those spikes and whatnot are actually drawing blood at every point and now it is definitively red yeah yes Although we do also see Superman get some actual good hits in, too, because he's like, oh, wait, these are all bone spikes coming out of this guy. What if I break them? <laughs> yeah. What if I just stop breaking his bones? And I love a lot of, like, the little details that they fill this in. Like, there's the Daily Planet newsstand that Superman, it like, hits Doomsday into when he breaks his kneecap. Um, and in the in the newspaper, it's Luther donates building to homeless shelter. Uh and, you know, we can just keep on world building this whole, like, Lex Luthor is, like, really selling himself as a good guy while this is all going on. They're fighting in front of the Daily Planet, and when they both punch each other, it's with such force that all the glass yeah. in the Daily Planet explodes, which I think is fucking cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think also, uh, yeah, a, a, a page before that, um, uh, the the splash pages switch to, like, you know, full page. There's no border. They're, they're just right to the edge as well so mm-hmm. it's like oh yeah yeah every, I, I, you know what i honestly didn't even notice that part so that's 
Yes. That's awesome. Oh, I, I noticed something. <laughs> <laughs> no that's really cool i like yeah because like now the fight is like really getting in there it's yeah like, it's it switches with superman now like bleeding in every single panel he's taking some kind of hit yeah and then the, then we get the actual like kill shot and like i don't know about you but like they just like kind of punch each other real hard yeah and, and then both go down i i, I guess because it's, it's one of those things where it's like you 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 want to you want to have the, the the final blow to be like and it was the thing that brought down Superman. But also, like, you have to have Doomsday die at the same time. Otherwise, just the biggest question is going to be like, okay, well, that's fine. But what happened to Doomsday afterwards? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Honestly, the the Daily Planet punch would have been the better shot to end it on. Because, like, they both punch each other so hard. Yeah. every Like, all the glass explodes. And if that's when they both, like, went down, it'd be like, oh, cool. Yeah. Instead, it's like Superman does, like, the Captain Kirk double hand, like, <laughs> s- smack against Doomsday. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Doomsday, between Superman's arms, uppercuts. Him. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's... <laughs> It's a perfect, like, hitbox situation in, like, Street Fighter 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, for a double KO. <laughs> uh, yeah, not only does he uppercut Superman, his, like, he clearly claws through Superman's chest as he as it goes up, which I guess makes it kind of more interesting. But, like, like Dan Jurgens is a good artist, but I, I don't think that big dramatic fights are quite his wheelhouse. Like, I think he just is a, a very capable artist generally. Uh, but like the, he's not the artist for, I don't know, man. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to shit on him. I'll, I'll, I'll say... The composition of the art is very nice, and they look very good. The choreography of the fight is perhaps not the strongest. Yeah, can you imagine if this was Jack Kirby? Yeah, yeah. Like, like that. That's all I'm saying. Like, and I, it's unfair to compare a superstar artist of the '90s with like literally the king of comics. Like, the, yeah, it's just yeah. two different tiers yeah. on that. But yeah, it, like, I, I, I really don't want to put it down too much it's just it's like cool but honestly cooler frame is than the next is the next splash page which is jimmy olsen in the reflection of his camera catching superman and yeah yeah, yeah. like down. like the 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 one <laughs> the, the one page from this chunk that isn't actually a fight is much cooler yeah and I, that's almost where i would almost rather not get the kill shot you know or or like at least not have it be told like oh this is the moment where they both got hit so bad they die like and just, like, get the silence of the, the camera. But, you know, we get some good text there where it's, like, for those who loved him, who one who would call him husband, one who would be his pal. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, like, like that, 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 that's one of those lines. It's, like, it's so corny, but it also kind of works in a way. Yeah. Uh, and then the next panel is Ma and Pa Kent hugging each other. This, by the way, is the limitation of the, the all every page is a splash panel. Uh, situation because they have to cheat like crazy all the time like su- they, because yeah, yeah, they have yeah. him on tv in in the shot before that um uh, in on the page before it's the reflection of the camera and that's really cool and like the tv it's also an iconic shot like if you take away those text boxes and you're just seeing superman dead on screen and ma and pa can't hugging each other really fucking cool shot like yeah. these these are really interesting compositions but it is definitely something that they're doing because they're doing a thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we get the JLAers catching up with ev- everyone, and everyone's crying. And one person has a Bugs, Bugs Bunny, Bunny t-shirt. t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't make it in time. And then Superman's just like, ah, ah, I, I, I did my best. Is he? Is he down? <laughs> Ship out of danger. <laughs> and then he died. Yeah. Yep. And at this point, the last two splash pages are two page spreads so we actually go from even getting down to from splash page to zoomed in splash page with no borders to then it's all two page spreads but it's only the last two so it doesn't quite feel quite as crazy yeah 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 so that's that's the death of superman it's it's just the the hulk but with claws shows up and superman fights him until they both die but there are artistic things going on here like the, you know, we talked about this when we talked about Superman Doomsday, where the fight itself isn't that interesting by virtue of it just being a fight. You know, it's the uh, it's the other things that are that are going on with it all. Like there's the artistic elements of like getting this like countdown in terms of panel count on each page. That's that's really cool. It's tying in this lar- this larger universe, like and the consequences of this universe. Those are really cool. You know, even the fact that Superman is getting more and more desperate and more and more hurt. Th- those are interesting elements of it all. Like. You know, the reason the fight goes the way it does is because 
Superman is so desperately trying to save the day and stop people from getting hurt. And Doomsday is capitalizing on that at every moment. Those are all really cool. But the actual, like, Superman and Doomsday punching each other part isn't the interesting part of all that. Yeah, the actual, like, the actual fight is fine. You know, it's good. It's, 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 it's good. Yeah. It's, it's good. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a punch about. But I feel like it's, I feel like it's one of those things that if you got someone now to be like, hey, like, could you, look, we really want to kill Superman again. Could you quickly do that for us? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like that there would be a lot of emphasis on like, okay, what's something bigger than Doomsday that we can that we can rustle up? How can they have a bigger punch up? How can they have a bigger fight? But the fight doesn't work without any of the other stuff around it. Because for me, reading it again, this, like this, this, you know, technically the second time, but basically for the first time is that the whole arc all of the issues prior do such a good job of setting up who doomsday is well not really, not really who he is but you know what he is how much of a threat he poses the stakes of him just tearing through the justice league having no regard for what's going on around him and then i think when he kind of gets away from superman and gets to metropolis he's pulled back but he still makes it to the city and the news gets involved everyone's watching just the 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 stakes and the tension of everything that's happening is ramped up and up and up across the entire thing so progressively and like it, the as soon as you think okay we can't possibly raise the stakes any higher we can't possibly ratchet the tension up one another notch they do it and and it just and that is like the fight in isolation does not work and is no offense a little a, a little meh it's 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 just a fight but because it has such well told prelude to it it's i like i when i was reading it i'll be honest i was like i was getting a little bit emotional cuz i was like oh my god like this is such a like massive thing obviously i know he comes back to life but i was still like i was still like oh Please. man Please. Like, Please. Oh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm like i'm like the story is 20 years old at this point but but nevertheless when i was reading it i was like oh jeez louise like this is this is a lot. It was, yeah, I, yeah, it was good. I really, I, I, I hate to say this. It's not 20 years old. It's going to be 30 years old. Hey, listen, months. Case. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll find the 90s are 20 years ago. Uh, yes, the, for forever. It was like, oh, like 10 years ago, like the 90s. Okay, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm in my 20s. That's, that's, that's true forever. <laughs> Right, yeah, forever twenty-seven. That's, that's where we all want to be forever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think you're right though. When when we're talking about the fight versus the stakes, and I think that part of the reason there's a reputation for this fight being kind of overblown and not that interesting, even though I think that there's a lot going into it, is that I think a lot of people look at the issue itself, uh, like issue seventy-five the the actual death fight as opposed to everything leading up to it because then you're just looking at just splash pages you're just looking at like the like they're in their final p part of the battle you know when you do an issue that is entirely splash panels then you at most have like 20 some pages or 20, 20 some panels to deal with as opposed to the previous issue has double that just by virtue of how the math works on that mm. you know so like even if you have extra pages because it's a big you know a big important issue like you still have only a limited space for storytelling. And so that's why the lead up issues are so important. That's why the jail, like the justice league America issue is so important because you need to establish that like, yeah, no Martian Manhunter is there and someone who, you know, might be a rival for wonder woman is there and a green lantern is there and they're not able to stop this guy. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, that is also a spot where it's like, it would have been nice if it was like the classic seven. Well, I mean, they've, they've redone this like, I don't know how many times. <laughs> And like the movies and stuff, and like now the the seven are there, and I feel like this one does a better job. <laughs> well, they're allowed to hurt them, you know. Again, yeah. like that would be the like what I was saying before. If it was Hal Jordan and Batman, would they be allowed to do the amount of brutality against those Justice Leaguers? I mean, you haven't seen the uh, that Justice League Dark movie, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, well, I feel like they could have. This is like just to show, like, what was at stake. I mean, of course, you're gonna have. Well, that Batman could have beat him if he had more time. Nonsense. 
but uh, Wonder Woman gets she gets thoroughly handled. Hal gets beat to death. Like the Flash gets wrecked. They all get beat pretty badly, and then Superman shows up and like has to try to finish the day. But I feel like I feel like with this iteration, it does a much better job of saying mistakes with this one because it it does it without having to have like the headliners or like the main Justice League people. And it's like you said before, like, these are still some pretty good heavy hitters. Like these guys should not be like pushed aside or anything. They're like they're pretty good, but even still, they still get wrecked. Well, and one thing I like about this, the book in general, and it's again, it, it's just not in issue 75 because that that is the very end of this fight. Um, but everything leading up to it is showing the bigger world that Superman inhabits at this point. You know, there's a reason why they have him crash into Cadmus, you know, because we need to remind everyone Cadmus is a big part of the Superman lore. There's a reason why, like, we have to focus on Matrix at one point because she, at this point, is the only part of the Superman family that exists, even if she's like this weird anomaly for it. <laughs> the weird shit with Lex Luthor. They want to keep they want to keep that story going. You know, they want to keep building this larger universe that the characters are inhabiting. At you know, at this point, it's it's six years after the big revision, after the big relaunch of the of the books, and there's a lot of continuity. There's a lot of lore. There there is the, this big interconnected universe. And even if each, each book is like focusing on different parts, like they want to like remind you of this. I don't want to call it a victory lap, but that is kind of what they're doing here. They're like, look at all the things that we've been doing with Superman while it, while we're leading up to this. Like if this had been the end of the arc of the Man of Steel Superman to this point like if it you know if if they were like we're done we're going back to the silver age (laughs) (laughs) which not that dc would ever do anything like that looking at you new 52 (laughs) but that i mean that is what they're doing there though uh they're they're trying to remind us like here's all the the weird things that are out there um and i want to call attention to the last page of the trade or of the most recent trade. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are looking at it. It's 211 on the comiXology. This is the the thumbnail, or like this is their like chart of how they like try oh, to track all the issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you can see that it's broken down by like what, what issue, what arcs are going on. Because some characters, you know, cross over. Like Lois Lane is in all of these books versus like Cat Grant only shows up in two of them. Um, you know, like it, all the books are going to kind of focus on different characters and like how the fallout occurs. Like, there's a lot and editorial is working their ass off to make sure that they're not directly contradicting each other in everyone in each other's books, because again, it's different writers for every book. Yeah. It's like, that's a project. Yeah. It's it's something that I don't think is necessarily always given a lot of credit, especially for, um, uh, multiple series crossovers like this is that like someone at the end of the day does have to like, you know, chart it like this and, and make sure that people, that things do actually make sense. Cause Obviously, if you just left all your writers to it, it, you know. Yeah. You know, like, there's a lot of talk these days about, like, the, the like, the Hickman X-Men team that's going on right now. That There's, like, an X-Slack and, like, there's an X-Office and there's a head of X, even if Hickman stepped down now. Um, you know, trying to keep everything kind of coordinated between it all as a way of sort of looking back on the early days when it was, like, Stan and Jack and Steve. And they were all, like, doing stuff at Marvel and, like, Stan could, like, put in notes but, but across books because he was doing the... I guess he was doing the dialogue. Maybe he was doing the plots. Who can really say? <laughs> Stanley would have told you both. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it's clear that in the 90s, the Superman office was doing stuff like that, like that they were really trying to be coordinated with each other, have this like deep intercontinuity while at the same time telling different stories from very different viewpoints. You know, again, lo- like Wheezy, Louise Simonson, is telling much more sto- like stories about people on the ground there's a reason why every time we cut to like actual characters that we're supposed to know and the consequences of it, it's in the Superman man of steel book. Uh, Action comics always has an ethos of like, well, let's have like big, crazy, you know, big, crazy bombastic scenes. And that's why we get a treehouse fight that, you know, gets destroyed. (laughs) (laughs) You know, they're, they're different styles, but they all are the stories of Superman and his extended universe. Uh, Last big thing I want to talk about is the design of doomsday. Uh, This is, (laughs) this, this is a character that was like, his appearance was, uh, was trickled out to everyone you know at first he's all wrapped up uh in this like green jumpsuit with like red goggles and like he's bound up and so forth and only at first only like little bits of bone are, sh- are showing through by the end he's like you know fully fully revealed as this gray skinned behemoth with white hair and, and spikes all over what are your thoughts on doomsday in general like a- aesthetically i mean it's okay i mean <laughs> it does seem like it's one of those 
one of those characters that are create just for a story. Like they don't have any other purpose except for this one particular thing. Because he literally comes out of nowhere and uh and just beats the crap out of everyone. But aesthetically like the bones are cool. Like <laughs> I think they regrow, don't they? <laughs> yeah. yeah. They regrow after as they get broken. And like 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 because that's his thing. He he you can't kill him the same way twice. So like his bones grow back but they're stronger than they were before. I mean I, I would have done without the whole rubber suit coming out of the, the ground. <laughs> <laughs> it just had him come out like uh like normal i think we always like when you think of doomsday how you see him normally but uh see i i see that as like an escalation thing like re on this reread i was thinking about how it's like it like a very shonen style like this is not my final form kind of thing <laughs> going on with him. Uh, and i thought that was kind of cool like it, you know it's so easy to look back on doomsday in his in how we see him at the end because again Everyone, everyone fucking bought issue 75. It was super well sold. <laughs> like, everyone knows what Doomsday looks like. Same way everyone knows what like the final form for Frieza looks like. But like it is important to set up earlier on that like e- with his arm bo- tied behind his back, he's able to take out the Martian Manhunter. Not just the Martian Manhunter. The entire Justice League. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but we start off with this like much more restrained version. And the, like there's a mystery to him, which is kind of trying to like drive you to be like, all right, well, what? you know, we see a little bit more and we see a little bit more. Uh, and I, I think that's kind of a cool thing going on there. Yeah. I, I would actually, I, t- I totally agree with you, with you guys. I, I, I think like having him come out, especially with the, like the one arm behind his back and like face fully covered. Um, it like gives it a little bit of mystery. And then, you know, when, when the gloves come off as it were, um, you know, again, it's just a cup of that, like building the tension, you know, ratcheting it up just one more notch. Um, Overall, though, the design, totally agree uh, that it is a character that is made for a story. Um, (laughs) And it's like, someone was like, okay, what if there was a guy and he was like big and he looks scary and he, I don't know, has some fucking spikes and he, yeah, fuck it. That's it. That's all we need. (laughs) <laughs> a, a, a guy and he has spikes like it, you know there's obviously now the design is like oh yeah that's doomsday because you know he killed superman but i feel like there's nothing particularly i don't want to say there's nothing particularly interesting about the design because that's real that's really harsh but fuck it there's nothing particularly interesting about the design like it's very cliche let me throw out a a lens to view it under that might change your thought on this one so we've talked about how mitch is supposed to be these sort of like superman is boring type teens like he's an odd like not an audience surrogate but like a surrogate for the type of fans who they were trying to sort of comment on um this is very much in the throes of like the grim dark image revolution and whatnot um and the choice to have a character who is explicitly covered with spikes uh including having spiked shoulder pads extending from his body um (laughs) does feel deliberate. Like it does feel like there's a a commentary about design trends in comics in general, and that Superman is resisting it, but ultimately succumbs to it. If you're looking at it from the, the artists trying to do a commentary on the comics of the day and like all the extreme design trends of that era. And I have to imagine Louise Simonson, who again was working on new mutants until she was assigned Rob Liefeld as her artist. And then he was a giant prick and got her pushed off the book. I imagine that she might have something to say about those design trends of the era. Uh, <laughs> possibly, yes, possibly. So I like I I think I I agree with you that like by himself, Doomsday is like kind of boring, and like if you I mean boring in the sense of like you know it's it's very efficient to be a big strong guy with spikes. Like yeah, he's he's gonna do his job, um, and that he never works after this. <laughs> like every yeah. time they try to do a story with Doomsday <laughs> after this, it's like. Why? <laughs> yeah. Like, like, you did your one thing. We don't need it again. Um, yeah, I do find it interesting but, when Doomsday, like, pops up in other things as, like... Yeah. You know, and I'm just like, but he already did. He has one job. Well, like, and he's already like, done so, it. So, like, whenever he pops up in, like, the mainstream, like, anime series or whatever, like, they automatically go, like, okay, Doomsday's here. We need this, this, and this to handle him. And then he's, like, put down, like, 15 minutes, and they go about doing their other business. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's like in those like later Dragon Ball Z stuff when like Nappa shows up and it's like, yeah, the guy who killed everyone and like way back when. But now everyone can like crack a planet by sweating and like this guy can't even do that. Yeah. So what what's he going to do? Get handled. 
yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. So, oh god, it's Raditz. Like, <laughs> yeah. oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like there is that vibe. Like, because there's a scene in like Superman, Batman, like the the arc where they re- introduce Kara Zor El, where yeah. like an army of Doomsdays are sent against them, and like Batman <laughs> is doing fine. No. But, like, <laughs> you know, you can't you can only do so much. But I will say, if it is a commentary specifically on the tropes of the era, I find that interesting. I find this one story interesting in a vacuum. And it is only when you, you have more stories with Doomsday that I think it like becomes really kind of pointless. Fucking, I, 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 I fucking hate his, his origin that they reveal later on. <laughs> like, it's so fucking dumb. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, re- I'm reading it right now on Wikipedia. And yeah, I, it's really stupid. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't joking that they just keep murdering babies until the babies stop dying. Yeah. Like, yeah. Th- yeah, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> yeah, that that's his origin. Just alien scientists on Krypton murder babies. Yeah. Uh they get they pick up the goop. They think that's how it works. <laughs> Rinse and repeat. But the actual story here, and again, issue 75 is just the the final part of that battle. It's the f- you know, if this is a Rocky movie, this is the last round of that boxing match. Like all this, like the, the, the match itself is just the catharsis after everything be, like building up to it. And at this point, this is a, a larger story of the Justice League trying, failing Superman, trying repeatedly failing. Like he's, he's not successful at stopping Doomsday from doing all this violence throughout um, and being tested and pushed harder. And beyond that, Superman is a character existing in this larger continuity at this point. And all of a sudden, all of those storylines for Superman are kind of just cut short. You know, he is a reporter. He was engaged to Lois Lane. They weren't married at this point. Like, it's just they were engaged and then he's dead. You know, like it's like how bittersweet are all those elements that are just like, yeah, this this character who we thought was always going to be there is is now gone. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I don't know. I, <laughs> forever. Yeah, it, um, it, it is, it, it, it is, I, I always have this like interesting thought on th- this in particular, this, this book in particular, in that like, there's a part of me that always recognizes like, oh, what a like cynical cash grab, like just trying to like drive up the value of comics, like, pff, you know, as they always do with their big events. But then there's another part of me that's like, oh. But it's really good, <laughs> you know. Yeah, <laughs> like, and and it is, it is actually like, at the, in, you know, in the end, it is really sad, and it, and it's like, it they they do strike the tone really well of like we've really lost an icon, we've really lost something super important, and it, and and you know, the first time I read it, and this time I got to the end and was like, damn, that was really good. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, like we're gonna we're gonna talk more about the the fallout of all of this, which I also think is really interesting and probably more. I mean, for, I should note when I say that I read this in trade and whatnot, I read the Return of Superman first, I, and I played the video game before either. I was <laughs> like, because I just happened to get the trade for Return of Superman, and I was like, because I was really into Superboy, and I still am really into Superboy, but I was like, he's cool and he's got a jacket. I want to read this book. I think, you know, this is as much as anything meant to, like, get people to, like, check out Superman stuff for the first time in forever, because a lot of people had probably tuned him out after Man of Steel. And this is just, like, here, here, here is our little, little celebration of everything we've done, and then we're going to get real weird by having, like, six months of Superman just not being in his own books. I feel like, were it me, I'd kill Superman, cancel all the books, and then Superman doesn't come back, because... Like what a power move! <laughs> yeah, that would be wild if this was just like flat out. All right, yeah, no, no Superman's now dead in DC Comics. Yeah, in D- yeah, in DC Comics, Superman is dead. Super- Superman is actually dead as a property. No one can license him ever again. This, this, the last panel of this, last time you ever see him. <laughs> Gotta be, oh man! <laughs> like, can you? I just can you? Like, can you imagine if they actually, if there actually wasn't? Any other Superman comic, like, you know, they reference him, they talk about him, and they miss him. But he is dead. It's just always like, isn't it sad that Superman died? <laughs> yeah, right. But obviously that's not how this would all go. And, you know, we all we all know all the stuff that would come from it. It gets weird. It it, it gets sad for a while because, like, they, they do spend quite, like, they have, like, multiple issues about the funeral for Superman. Uh, and then people dealing with grief. There's a whole issue where Jonathan Kent has a heart attack and then, like, kind of envisions himself in heaven talking to his son uh, for one issue. And then we get the reign of the Superman where we get all the Superman characters 
out there. There's there's so many Supermen in that. There's there's four of them, maybe five, kind of five because there's because because real Superman shows up <laughs> and Supergirl. So six. There's there's six of them. Real Superman. Are you t- Casey, are you telling me that Superman didn't stay dead forever? Is that what you're trying to yeah, tell me? There, there's a reason why it's usually collected as the death and return of Superman. <laughs> Uh, but but I do think that this story has merit, even if it often is overlooked or dismissed as being kind of just a cash grab kind of moment. Uh, so I'm really glad to reread it because it's been a while since I've had a reason to look at it. And, you know, we did just recently talk about Superman Doomsday. So it, it was good for me to look at it, this and be like, yes, the things I said in that episode where I was like, oh, this movie can't do the artistic cool stuff that the comic was doing at the time that made the fight kind of interesting. I feel like I'm vindicated. Like, I, I feel like those st- those statements are backed up by my read of this. So I feel good about that. <laughs> so, Kieran, thank you for coming on th- to talk about this book. Thank you so much for having me. I was uh, very excited to talk about this, I have to say. I finished it, and I turned to my partner, and he was like, oh, was your... He said, was your comic good? And I said, yes, it was. I can't wait to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was great having you back on. It's been it has been a long time. Gosh, yes. When was the last time I was on? I remember. Was it twenty? It was twenty twenty since I've been on on uh, on. Yeah, this. it was twenty twenty. It was for the generations episode that J Mike was right. not able to make the last minute, and so we had to submit it. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Generations. Oh, Sorry, goodness. you had shit going on, man. Like twenty twenty was a rough year for all of us. Yeah. That is an understatement, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Understatement of the <laughs> fucking censure. A 20, yeah, 2020, you know, this is the one that's a little bit rough. You know, some, some <laughs> stuff happened, but, you know, we all got through the other side perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, thanks so much for having me on. I, I, had a really, I had a really great time. I had a really great time. Uh, where can people find you and follow you? What what have you got going on? So you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Mr. K underscore Bennett. You can also check out my D&D podcast currently on Hiatus for Crits and Giggles, which is at for CNG podcast. Uh, you can also check out my comic book podcast uh, where I talk about more comic books. Uh, that is Inks and Issues, which is at Inks and Issues on Twitter. And I do not know when this comes out. And I do not know what Jonah and I will necessarily be able to do in the next few weeks. But hopefully... That show will be coming back soon after oh, great. Yeah. a long and unintended hiatus. Yeah, hiatus has happened, as uh, the scruffy nerf herders know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but it, thank you again for coming on. It has been way too long. I, uh, I'm glad that you are, are are still casting those pods, because uh, you're, you're a voice I like hearing. Still casting those pods. Yeah, every day to casting those pods. Uh, J. Mike, how about you? Where can people find you, follow you? What have you got going on? You can find me on Twitter at jmike101. I do funny memes, gifts, fun stories, whenever I ever actually decide to post anything. I have a question, though, Case. Sure. Ruffy, any timetable, when it might ever come back. So it, it is not entirely me, but it is a matter of us like all getting together. Because like, we, we just did not work very well when we were trying to do it online. So... <laughs> now, now that things have settled down a bit and we can actually hang out in person, we need to get that happening. We also just need to see each other in person again. Yeah. Like we, we've been, we have been randomly texting. We have a group thread and that will just randomly be like, so is this a good week for us just to hang out? Like, it'll be like, yeah, no, that works. And then like one person can't. And then we'll just sort of like move on to the, the yeah. next. It, like every like week or so we're like, hey, how about now? Oh, no. Oh, OK. How about now? Uh, okay. Yeah. Have a now. Oh no. Okay. Relatable. Uh, very, very yes. relatable. <laughs> it's gonna happen. It's gonna it's happen. Gonna happen. <laughs> like we we hit issues or er, issue. We hit episode seventy five. Hey, seventy five is also issue. Superman dies. Yay! Um, <laughs> but we hit episode seventy five, and that was supposed to be the halfway in the the second arc. And uh, I I do want to get there. So yes, we scruffy nerf herders will be back. And we will finish off at least the last 25 episodes of this arc. So, yes, we that that is going to happen. It's just, I don't know when. Life. It finds a way, but it is difficult sometimes. Um, That's actually the full quote. Life uh, yes. finds a way, but it is difficult sometimes. Yes, yes. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to check out cool stuff that's like Scruffy and Nerf Herders, uh, at CertainPOV.com, you can find tons of great podcasts, including Reignite, which has done several Mass Effect-themed 5th edition-based TTRPG 
session. So check those out. We did, we've done several, uh, one of which I've converted into an animated format, which you can find on our YouTube channel at certain POV media. Check that out as well. I've got videos up there for Superman analogs. I, we've got clips from a lot of our shows that are going up on there. So the YouTube channel is a great place to check that out. Uh, CertainPOV.com, again, has so many great shows. So Reignite, awesome. If you like Mass Effect, check it. Check that out. Like the wonderful conversations between Frankie and Matt about like the choices you would make through that role-playing game. And sometimes we do more interactive versions of all that. It's just a, it's an awesome show. And if you like sci-fi stuff, that that's there. And if you want... A, a, a live let's play or, or a real play podcast. We've got some episodes like that. So that's all at certain POV.com. Uh, you can also find a link to our discord server there. We have such a great community that we've been building on discord. Like we, we do sneak peeks. We have awesome people just to chat about nerdy stuff. Come, come join us. It's, it's a lot of fun. As for me, uh, if you don't feel like doing the discord thing, you can find me on Twitter at case Aiken. And yeah, we will be back next time for more discussion about the death and return of Superman stuff. But until then, stay super, man. Men of Steel is a certain POV production. Our hosts are J. Mike Folson and Case Aiken. The show is edited by Matt Storm. Our logo is by Chris Batista. Episode art is by Case Aiken. And our theme is by Jeff Moon. We've made difficult decisions. And there are still more ahead of us. Two people aren't enough to save the galaxy. We need the toughest. Smartest. Deadliest allies. We need you. We need you to join us. And listen to Reignite. A certain point of view podcast about storytelling. Love. And Mass Effect. Join us every other Thursday as we fight for the fate of an entire galaxy. You can find us everywhere you get your podcasts. Or at certainpov.com slash reignite. We're counting on you. We should go. CPOV. Certainpov.com.